So we have with us um, Dr. Paul O'Malley, who's the superintendent from Butler School District 53 in Illinois, who does amazing things. And I'm going to stop sharing, make sure I can see him. Hi, hi Dr. O'Malley. Hi, Lilani. Good. How are you? It's been a while. It's been a while. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a while. I miss being able to be in person. You know? Yeah, me too. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. We are planning to get on the road next year. There's a few places we, we know we won't be able to get into, but um, yeah, we're definitely looking forward to seeing people again live. So why don't we do this? Um, if you want to share screen and give us sort of an overview, or if you just want to talk through kind of everything that's been happening for you, we can go either way. Do you want, do you want to take over screen? Uh, let's just talk through. I mean, there's, okay. You know, we're just doing, it's ironic because it's almost as if you're reading my mind when you're presenting because we started a process prior to the pandemic. We call it Flip the Classroom. And um, it's really just a difference in the, in the taste of your coffee. In some cases, you you would press your coffee and, and it's great tasting and it's a practice that a lot of people do, but we chose to, to percolate our coffee. So what we've done is we've flip the classroom, not flipping the classroom, we flip the classroom and we allow our coffee to percolate. We allow our teachers to provide really just great pathways that they believe they could go so that they can improve their instructional practices. And, and the ironic part is they're in the trenches, they're with the students far more than any, any of us, that's for sure. And as a superintendent, we felt it was best for our teams, our team of teachers to really find pathways that they felt were best, not only for their students, but best for the district. And so pre-pandemic, we were working on a process where we had literally eight coaches in each of our buildings. And, and we only have two buildings uh, that we serve. We serve a, a park district. We have a, a daycare program in the park district, but um, we have eight coaches that we've we spread out through each, each each of the buildings. And the reason we've chosen eight coaches as opposed to a coach is for that very reason, right? A coach may not necessarily have all the skill sets or the tools in the toolbox that all of our teachers are going to use. That's the first thing. Uh, internally, it's problematic because you never know who is going to apply for that position or who didn't apply for that position, who may have qualified for that position. And I think the other part is, Hiring someone from the outside is sending a message that, quite frankly, our teachers don't know what to do. And someone coming in and knowing what to do when they really don't know our students and they don't know our staff is not the best approach. And so we felt if we, we harness the greatness of all of our teachers, they could provide this program. And so pre-pandemic, they were working on a pathway for our successes. And when the pandemic hit, we were just positioned in a really, really good spot to not only look at the practices that, that we needed to improve upon, but more importantly, and this is the key, we actually practiced what we were gonna do for the full year that a lot of people were in remote in the, in the state of Illinois. We were, not, we were not in remote, we were in person every day. However, we started with a 60-40 split. We started with 60% of our students in person, 40% were out. And as the year progressed, we went from 60-40 uh, 70, 30, we ended up about 85, 15 in terms of proportionality. And, and near the very end, we were at about 90, 10. And when graduation came along, it was hundred percent of the, the attendance uh, because the students, we wanted the students to be back. And, and so um, we were able to navigate with, with really, really the worst technology, I have to say. We did not have the technological means, but what it did provide us with is a, a pathway to then look at our technology. And, and the beauty of, of our professional development model, our FTC model, is our teachers knew exactly where the deficiencies were because they were able to work through one year of just poor technology. And, and I would almost, I would almost deem, it as, deem it as we, we had an ideal classroom and it was flopping like a fish on the deck of a boat. And we literally had to revive it. And, and I'm a catch and release guy. And so to us, it made sense to really revive our technology program. And that's what we did. So going into the summer of this year, our past summer, the most recent summer, we, we then created an ideal classroom that, that is really just state of the art. So um, we have MacBooks for all of our teachers, brand new, straight out of the box. Uh, there, there's PD that actually had to be... Um, that our teachers actually uh, created for their peers that, that helped us to, to really navigate very seamlessly. Uh, we, we have state-of-the-art TVs. That's literally, it's a giant phone. So whether you have a Google phone or, or a, an iPhone, um, 
literally they, our, our teachers are, are able to use the phone in their classroom, uh, which is magnified 10, 20, 100 times greater in size and in terms of its capability. I mean, even Elon Musk would be jealous of what we have in our classroom because it's just it's just so uh, within the, uh, the realm of what we're doing. And, and you know, to your point, when we go back to your previous slides, I think you'll really appreciate this. We're in the mutation phase. And so we, we really are now looking at how do we digitize Right? How do we move away from the paper and pencil, but how do we digitize and then get students acclimated to the digitization, which, which is another feat in and of itself, because you, you have people that have been teaching for, for, in some instances, 35 years, 30, 35 years, and that's all they know. And then you have other, uh, other teachers that are straight out of, out of college that have graduated um, that, that then have a certain set of skills. But to my point, that's why we have such a huge number of coaches, because those coaches, whether it's, it's something that, that is a skill that that has worked for many many years, or a skill that we are, is in its infancy. We're able to basically find the fulcrum, really the the balance beam, and or the fulcrum and the balance beam, so that we can make things work in the context of of where we're at, where we where we were, where we're at, and where we're going to go. And so, um, you know, just many great things. And then on top of that, we're we're actually hopefully going to be approving. A, uh, anywhere from 15 to 20 million dollars worth of construction projects. And so what we we realized is our spaces just really didn't fit. And, and so we were fortunate that that we delayed some of our construction projects because it, it gave us the ability to rethink literally what you had on the screen. What are our spaces going to do uh, in the future? What are they going to look like in their future? And then and then where are some some optionalities that we can harness? So that our teachers can be more and more advanced. And I don't want to talk too much. I want you to interject here, so so you can. Well, it's fascinating the yeah. journey that you're having, and you're you're leaving out like phenomenal amounts of detail. You you know you are, <laughs> you know the fights, the crying in your office. I know what happened, <laughs> but um, I want to get into that <clears throat> where you're going. This, yeah. I don't know how much you can admit live because this is going to go out nationally, right? The recording will yep. go out nationally. Um, are you losing any kids? Are kids uh, are no. out? No, we, we do not. We, we've been very fortunate. You know, our community, we serve a lot of, as I tell people, you know, we serve a lot of professionals that, that are doctors or nurses and lawyers. And so for us to be in person, it was mission critical because our doctors, our lawyers and our nurses, they had to be in the hospitals. And so that's yeah. the position we took from the very beginning and, and it, it was not easy. I mean, there were a lot of conversations behind the scenes with our association, hours and hours and hours of, of TLC. And we had to provide TLC, we had to provide support so that our, our staff could be super successful. But now they're on board. They're at a level that, that we've never seen before. And they have the, the utmost respect and confidence in our administrative staff, which has made it, made it really good for us because they now are able to see the trajectory of the situation more than ever before because it's it's clear the smoke is cleared to an extent that they could see a pathway they could see the path and they could be a part of this path and i think that's where we're getting that buy in more so than ever before because uh, we are looking in terms of our mutation we are looking at a, a program that can personalize the learning and, and we've realized that the lms for lack of a better term or phrase or or acronyms or or initials our LMS system is really many systems that are just, just compartmentalized, right? And so we need to really focus in on what I refer to as uh, strategic abandonment. There's a lot of things that we did that we need to abandon, that we continue to do, or that we want to do because that's what we did. And so to your point, you know, we, we probably have hundreds of apps, hundreds of programs that we're using and what we're doing right now with the the our, our coaches is we're going through each of those and we're we're determining, you know, number one, who is using those apps, and number two, if it doesn't meet a certain certain threshold of of needs within the building, then then we are not going to support it technologically because we need to get focused on on what are the best pathways, and then let's become very very good at those pathways. But at the same time, you know, let's build a learning management system, a personalized learning experience that not only has all the data. But more importantly, is able to, to be used as an opportunity where we can say, hey, look, here are the three, four, five skills that, that this particular student is going to need. And here are the three or four or five skills that the teachers are going to need professionally in terms of the development that are going to help uh, the one, two, five, 20, 35 students 
um, to basically move through their, their pathways, whatever the pathways are that they choose. <clears throat> Interesting. You're right at the point we're hearing more and more supernatives go. Yeah. And I just want to describe sort of that moving to the ultimate network model, right? The full personalization that's going to be increasingly in demand, especially if you have professional, a lot of professionals in your area, they're all going to be finding out about <clears throat> all the online options. They just will. Um, yeah. So you're in the, you're in the position and you said it very nice. You, you're, you want to strategically abandon some of the things that you have been doing. You know, a lot of the, like Classlink was talking about single sign on, they're telling yeah. you how much login is going on. But then I, I always question like, well, if the new, if the app is new, of course not everyone's using it in the year one, mm -hmm. but still you don't want to overspend. Right. Or maybe right. you do want to, maybe you want to call that company up and go, wow, this is being in so much use. I'm going to buy three years right now because I have the money right now um, yeah. or whatever. But, but that, uh, uh, focusing in on what your curriculum map is, mm -hmm. is not mm -hmm. like the first couple of years of tech ed tech coming in. Mm -hmm. Like ed tech came in and every superintendent everywhere was like in a letting, not leading mode. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm just going to defer to my teachers and I'm just going to let them do whatever they want because all power to the teacher. But now you're realizing, wait a second, everyone's in a, you know, they're all, it's like they all went astray and everybody's doing everything differently. And I have no continuity of operation. This sixth grade teacher for math is totally different set of resources than this sixth grade teacher for math. And I can't tell if the reason this one kids are flunking is because of the resource, the teacher or the kids, because I have no curriculum map of continuity. Right. Right. So right. then you get to be at the point where you're at right now, which is I got to rein this in, right? Which is like the textbook days. Remember those days? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, you, you prescribed. Cool. Yeah. And then you, and then as digital came in, everybody let everything work. And now it's like rain in. So talk to me about the inklings you have about actually getting to a full personalized curriculum map pathway creation mm -hmm. that is, that is operationally efficient teacher to teacher to teacher, because this is where it's really going to get hairy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a couple of things. So number, number one is uh, when I came into the district, they didn't even have curriculum maps. So um, I would hear, I'd hear from people that we have curriculum maps and, and, you know, to date, I, my inbox is empty when it comes to curriculum maps. So we, we created them from scratch and, and they're a document that's, that's a living document that, that our, our teachers, our administration is going to have to look at on an annual basis because it's never going to be the same every year. You're going to have to personalize it in the context of the cohort because each cohort is going to perform at different levels. You may have a cohort that performs at the 99th percentile, which we do, mm -hmm. and that may be the high end of the percentile, or you may have a core cohort that pour, performs at the bottom of the 99th percentile, if that's even imaginable. And so we have to make sure that we're, we're constantly taking a look. And, and, and it doesn't have to be written from scratch, but your I can statements definitely have to match the standards that you're trying to, to basically um, get your arms around. And I think there's two types of, of pathways to look at it. We talk about the triangulation of data. We're always trying to triangulate because we have our map data, we have the Illinois Assessment of Readiness, the AI data, mm -hmm. uh, we have the a science assessment in the state of Illinois, but, but it's our common assessments that are that are we believe are the weakest link that, that need to be addressed that, that we're working on at the junior high now and things are trickling down into the elementary. And, and so that's the first thing. But you also have to have a triangulation to your point of the professional development. Because yeah. every teacher is going to believe that they need to go on a specific pathway mm -hmm. that may not necessarily be within the context of the pathways that, that are, are uh, affordable or, or doable with our population. So that being said, we've, we've gamified it. And the yeah. gamification, whether it's a bronze, silver, gold, platinum, or diamond in terms of your professional development, you're going to see that certain people are going to be the trailblazers that that start to go down the pathway of investigating, for example, the four C's. And mm -hmm. it's contagious because the next teacher is going to grab it and the next teacher, and they're going to be able to lean on the four C leader. Um, you know, to my point, that coach, that coaches leadership to get them to where they need to be so that we can uh, very strategically abandon certain practices without even really getting into the, to the abandonment process. It actually is more organic in nature and it, and it's more, 
thoughtful, it's more meaningful. And at the end of the day, it's empowering to the teacher, right? It's percolating. So therefore, just like your diagram, um, it's going to work its way from the from the classroom to the administration. And our job is to support that. And from time to time, as Rick de- before would say, you're going to have top-down management, right? You're going to have top-down yeah. leadership. That just has to be a part of the organization. But but the up, percolating up is is just far more powerful. So, you know, those are some of the things that we're, we're basically putting into context so that, that we can position ourselves so that we have this triangulation process so that it's it's very clear, um, you know, it's very constant and, and it's transparent. People know what we're talking about and it becomes more or less the common language that we're, we're constantly perpetuating in the system uh, to put us, ourselves in a position to be, you know, goober successful, as, as I'd say. Yeah. Yeah, I like this. But I step outside and I, I'm looking at you from an, as an outsider, right? I'm looking in. Yeah. I talk to tons of executives all over the country. Oh, yeah. And it feels like, and I don't know if you recognize this, you're going through the sorting process. Yeah. You're, you're sh- you know, you're, you're sorting the wheat from the shaft and it's a process. And what you're ultimately going to find is the best rubric of it all is how do I best use my humans? Yeah. So you flip your thinking into, I got all this ed tech, but how do I perfectly use the human intersection to 100% personalize? What Mm -hmm. tech is going to get me there? Because that's the real issue now. You have less humans, right? Usually most districts do. And you have to use them at their absolute perfection. So you'll start thinking about what is teaching. What right. is teaching? So what are your thoughts about that particular question? Like, are you like going through anything on that? Well, for the first time in the history of education, you know, the best practice has been challenged. And it was a very, very good you know, I say this, you know, very lightly in, in, in the pandemic, we try and look at the positives. We always try and reflect on what was most positive, but because of that, we took a good look of our, at our practices. And, and to your point, you know, that we had practices that were quite frankly antiquated. It didn't fit within the realm of, of getting us to where we need to be, which is, is really starting to look at the platform of how do we get ourselves so that we can balance the hybrid model. And that's really what we're looking at right now. How do we balance that model? How do we uh, just provide the pathway with, where you have the digitizations that can get us to a level where, where kids become or more autonomous? And so we're looking at the autonomy and how autonomy is going to play a bigger role uh, for the children so that they could be more engaged in their learning. I love that you brought up autonomy. I was going to bring that up when we're on the panel later, but um, let's get into that now because our other speaker that's joining us um, is is at the tech level. So it's better we you just you and I talk about it and I'll throw some other questions at the two of you later. But I think student agency over the pandemic was a gift. I think it forced every student in America when we were out almost everywhere, not you, but everyone had to get themselves out of bed in the morning and get on the right Zoom call and make sure they were dressed. And, you know, like they're used to the bell ringing and then they robotically or like little zombies go to the next thing, right? Um, And they were run 100%. But now student agency, that student autonomy went just nuclear over the pandemic. And it's a good thing. So talk to me about your aims to, um, you know, shore up that autonomy. What are you thinking? Well, I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm super liberal when it comes to online. I believe that, that we should open this up uh, so that students can go at their own pace. In fact, I was a part of a, I was at a school district where we were one of the first ones to go to our legislators and, and receive reprieve on, on creating an online school and, and, and I, I, I believe that they did not follow through to, to the greatest extent that they could have. And, and it is what it is. But, but in my mind, I, I think that we're going to leave some latitude to our teachers. And I'm hopeful that some of the teachers that, that recognize that the online platform is not something that, that is, is negative. It's actually positive. And if we could look at some of these platforms as we're creating our journey, as we're starting to personalize it, if we have a student that's far advanced in math, then I, I don't understand why we wouldn't even hold that child back. Um, we don't do it for athletics ever. If a person is athletically gifted 
and they're a freshman, they can make the varsity team. We see it all the time. Or if you have someone who's gifted in, in terms of hockey, um, if they're playing in central states, they may play in AAA or they may try to travel internationally. But but in education, we seem to, to suppress people that may advance, which may actually at the other rung of the ladder provide greater resources to address our, our inequities that are taking place so that we can have greater resources so that we can lift all of our students because all of our students can soar, right? And what we do is we have this, this bad habit of compartmentalizing, right? We have the eagles, we have the bluebirds, we have the buzzers and the wombats. That's not how it works. What works is all our students can soar. We need to believe in all our students soaring and, and they're gonna go at different levels within in their abilities and we have to provide pathways for them to meet those levels. And so, I feel very strongly about as we're working through this, challenging uh, the norms and looking at, to my point, digitizing certain academics that we can then expand upon if the digitization doesn't meet our needs. Because there's no need, to your point, to purchase textbooks that are going to literally be on a shelf. And they may look good, uh, but they may not be being used at a level that's expected, right? And, and you don't have to go too far back in time for us in the state of Illinois to remember when the state actually gave grants for textbooks. And, and that has, um, you know, really passed its point of being distributed. And it's, it's no longer, in my opinion, going to be something that, that we need to do. Uh, but at the same extent, uh, we're looking at ways that we can connect uh, not necessarily nationally, but internationally. And so you'll have to stay tuned on that one, but we have a few teachers that are showing some interest, piquing their interest. We're just, we're just working our way through it because it, it's really about the cadence now. It's about the pace and making sure our pace is not too overwhelming. But at the same time, you know, to your point, you know, we have boards of education that we answer to. And, and in some cases you may have uh, boards that are more traditional and may not necessarily see the value. So you have to bring everybody forward at the same time. Otherwise, it's it's going to be a situation where you're circling back when you don't need to circle back if you do it if you do it very gracefully. Yeah, we should send your board the game, the the future of structure, and that, and make them all play roles. You know, I'll I'll help you figure out how to download that because you should do it with your board. Um, it's an interesting situation that you're in. And I love the nonlinear thinking. You're not thinking like a lot of the superintendents where they're very tied to the empire that they're running. They want the empire to be new. They're like, this is the wild west. Let's like develop new territory and go forth and conquer new stuff. That's great. That's the real sign of a leader. Um, and I, and I like the way you're thinking about moving towards that self pace and a full sort of curriculum map that that then could be layered on top of with all your side roads and little eddies for the smart kids that went this way. And then this one fell off somewhere and needs remediation and math, but then you get them fixed and they zoom forward and it's awesome, right? Like, I really totally agree with you. Every kid is a genius. Every kid. It's just how the execution went with that kid. Like they missed something about what a denominator is and fractions and everything in math went fuzzy for them after that. And nobody ever fixed it. Like that's teaching now, right? Teachers I want to define as the person who got into your face and unraveled exactly what was going on. Like that is the thing that yeah. we all want, right? Um, to, to be the person who says, you're a genius too. Let's fix this. What do you not get? Like, let's get into it. Right. Um, and then everyone moves ahead. I love that. Um, so anything else you want to talk about, you know, in terms of like just the experience of all this change, like it's got to be, it's got to have a huge human side toll for you too. Yeah. Well, I, I will share with you. It's, it's, um, I, I never thought I would, I, you know, I have a chem degree, chem background, science, chemistry, physics, natural science. I taught, uh, you know, special ed. Uh, master's of special ed. And so I, I, I think I'm pretty well versed. I never thought I would spend as much time as I am in, in the realm of technology. And so I think that my, my infancy, my, my noviceness has, has not necessarily ex exploited itself, but has, has really taught me to just be far more open, far more engaged. And I think it's really accelerated uh, my ability to really focus on the realm of the technological aspects that are available. And then how can we really 
simplify, if this is even doable, how can we simplify the technology for the teacher at the front of the classroom so that they can expedite their learning curve so they're not spending as much time on the technology per se, but more on the pathway to use a technology to garnish the power of the curriculum that's available. And so I think that that is something that we've really perfected and we're perfecting and we will continue to perfect over and over and over. Um, as I said, we just have people that are on the, on the spectrum of technology. It's just very broad, very robust. And, and somehow we've got to get it down to here are the five, like I said, the five, six, seven, quite possibly eight things that define us. And the, the more perfect we are at those eight, um, then and only then can you add to uh, additional skill sets. And, and I think that's one of the things you're going to find. And, and the way I put it is, you know, we can land rovers on Mars, right? We have cameras that are on Mars. And we could communicate with that rover and those and see what's on 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 the cameras themselves. But at the same extent, we we have professionals that are literally visiting space for the first time. I mean, who who would have thought that that Captain Kirk would be in space for the first time ever? <laughs> we and, thought he was there the whole time. What? Well, that's exactly it. So <laughs> so you know, for the first time ever, you know, we're able to do things, and and we always hold back in education. And I think this is our time to just to your point to just to just take those chances and. We could take them really slow, but at the same extent, I, I think there's just a lot of positivity to come out of this. And I think it's going to start with the personalized learning. And I think we're going to have to personalize that pathway. And then and only then are we going to be able to see, to your point with your diagrams, are you going to really be able to truly see, you know, the power of that student? Because uh, that's that's going to be the, the real challenge because we are, to your point, we're very, very compartmentalized and very specific and and again, we're challenging the best practice, the in-person practice. And so this is the first time that that truly we're going to be able to open up in ways that are just so much more powerful. Yeah. And I love that you put it that way. And we're challenging that in-person practice, but you're not challenging the power of human in, 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 intersection of the learning. You're not challenging that. And no one is, right? That's where people get this all wrong. Like I'm going to be all digital. It's going to be all online. But that means we have to have this perfected use of how we use the humans. Um, you're not ever questioning. I don't question that at all. I've been accused of it, but I don't question that at all. I accuse how well they're used. Um, are they used for just sitting in the classroom while the kids do their reading? What? Why are they doing that? Um, so that was excellently well put. I would suggest that you start thinking along the lines of digital, not just, not just digitized. Because truly digital is a different expression of how you learn. It's a different expression of the resources. And if you get to the point where you're actually looking at by subject, right? Certain subjects are already fully digital. Math is one of them. A lot of the learned language learning is another where students enter the gamified world and they're pelted with quizzes and they're put up at the next level. Teacher can gate them, right? Like don't go to the next level until I say, and I want to talk to you first. And, you know, so there's teacher intersection. But the, the teacher's not doing the traditional stand up and deliver or assign a chapter. The software is doing that. And they're watching the analytics and running down to little Johnny who's running away behind and fixing him. It's a totally different definition. But you can't do that in every subject yet. Right. So, yeah. So, so your map is going to be, you're in for a few years of total fun. Like, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to be awesome. Okay. Well, I think we're at the bottom of your um, half hour. Um, I know you're coming back in about 15 minutes, but I'm going to let you like take a break um, so that, you know, I don't like have you for two full hours and exhaust you. Um, so, so go ahead and do that. And then I'm going to bring up a couple things and then welcome you back to the panel. Is that okay? Awesome. See you soon. Awesome. Okay. See you in a minute. All right. Um, so, so we talked a lot about um, right there, and we have this little fifteen-minute interlude for anybody that's on the line right now to also take your own break, stand up, do jumping jacks and push-ups, um, you know, run and get a snack or whatever it is that you need. But I'm going to sort of summarize of a little bit about what we've just learned and put it in context from a national perspective of what's really happening here um, because of what um, Dr. O'Malley just said. He, he, he's in an interesting dynamic of having, you know, sort of retained um, the physical environment almost the entire time, 
But he did say a couple of things. And I'm going to go back to this slide just to point it out to everyone. Um, so you can think with it too. They, he knows, and most district leaders know, we're in the middle of a national mutation at the uh, school and district level. And it's towards this middle part of individualizing our delivery through tech. And this is very much more profound than most people realize because we're not talking about thinking anymore like I'm delivering through a little army of teachers. So I'm kind of hands off. I just kind of let them do what they want. And they, I just give them their general assignments and maybe one or two required resources and some pacing guides. But it's a letting this more than anything else. And they can do whatever they want to be digitized. The mutation towards focusing our entire attention on the individual student and not on sort of a gray mass of, well, there's all the students out there, but I don't look at them individually. I really look at them through the lens of the teacher. The teacher is my front line and I'm back line. So this mutation pattern is towards that final thing you see on the screen, which is an execution to the individual student in a complete flip of the institution. That's where we're going. It changes your basic organizing principle. It should change the way you frame things in your own mind. Um, how are we getting learning to students? So that kind of thing. So making sure anybody wants to ask me any questions before we have Giovanni and um, all of our other, uh, or Paul come back on. So we have a discussion where I'm gonna stump them with some other questions. Um, which is interesting way, new perspective for you to learn from and probably some really great tips and tricks out of these guys. So just looking at who's on the line right now, um, anybody wants to pop on, I will allow you to talk and uh, give me your thoughts about where we're standing right now. Nick, I know you're still on. Um, Melvin, you're still on. I don't know all the rest of these people. Let me see if I know anyone else. Um, if you want to uh, raise your hand, please do. Um, and pop on and say whatever it is that you want to say. I'm looking at my chat window. Hi, Melvin. I think you can unmute yourself. You're from South Carolina, I believe. Uh, North Carolina. North Carolina. Um, I was, um, I missed the second, um, um, what is that? Hybrid the religion. second model. I missed the second model. I was trying to get all of the models and I got them all except oh. the second one. Okay. And, um, all right, so here's model one then again. It's a traditional school model, right? It's yes. only, only different in that during the pandemic, everybody went to weird scheduling patterns. Like their calendars changed and they had things like longer blocks or AB days, like in New York, there were a lot of superintendents that told us, listen, we sectioned our big buildings to reduce the spread of COVID. We only allowed this population to come in through this door. They weren't allowed to come in any, in and out any other door and this population through another door. So weird things like that all started happening. So that's digital traditional. Then number two is blended or flipped. And the only serious difference on lesson planning for that one, Aunt Melvin, is you have all your teachers think with when you're physically together, you do things that are whole group or small group, they're discussion oriented, they're lecture oriented, but what you, and then in the evening is all homework. It's all your reading and everything else. Okay, so it's flipped in that you don't, the togetherness things are serious, um, focused togetherness and everything that isn't together is done separately. Okay. Okay. So that was two. Um, three is the competency-based contemporary. That's a, um, a batch model still, like the regular traditional, except that this model has been in operation for like 60-some years. It's based on competency, usually for small schools who have maybe one or two teachers for, for many different grades of kids. So they don't lecture, or very rarely. They're really just um, working on individual paced workbooks with kids. Uh huh. Okay, so we know this model. 
right? Um, yes. So they moved class to class. This was the foundation for hybrid logistics because the problem with this model is it doesn't scale. It works great in small privates, charters, all those places, doesn't scale. Um, then there's the fully online traditional. This is what was just passed in the law in California. Every district must have a fully online traditional. And then you, and then of course you have a lot of schools that also have their second rail. Those are the online kids over there. And then there's the traditional kids. And then flanking that is the fully online contemporary, fully like gamified level, not much human intersection. This is the stuff coming out of the big companies, you know, like Stride and Edison Learning. Um, Edison Learning though has a lot of live interaction with teachers. So the perfection of live interaction is the difference between the traditional model that's so stark. It's what people normally say. It's like, I don't want to do all online. My kid doesn't ever see any other kids or they don't interact with teachers. You know, the big problem, right? Uh -huh. Okay. And then six is hybrid simultaneous. This is the same basic model that normalizes everybody into grades and classes, except now every teacher is also teaching via video live at the same time they're teaching kids live in the classroom which just made people go, you know, get a lot of gray hair over the last year and a half. Teachers just went, some of them are really good at it. You know, some of them are like, this is so hard. That model is not going away because if we see COVID increase anywhere, that's coming right back. Um, and then there's the hybrid logistics contemporary, completely altered terrain of the physical environment as well as schedule because it goes to 100% personalized pathway that is now using advanced Amazon and FedEx level logistics to Uberize cohorts based on their pace. So teacher gets a pop-up and says, you're doing this class at a such and such time. I'm giving you 45 minutes to prep from the system. The students are told uh, five minutes in advance to go ask their homeroom leader for an excuse pass to go to this class. So the classrooms are empty. Everyone's in the homeroom or they're virtual, like they're virtual in their home, right? And they're cohorted based on pace. The teacher sets a lesson, intersection moment. They, they do it like this. Read this, then study this, watch this video, take this quiz. The next step is a live intersection moment. And it starts a clock. It starts accruing. Let's say they set it at 10 kids instead of 30. Once the 10th kid gets in, it triggers the meeting space and the class on the calendar. The, the first nine, when they hit that, they, they're told, study something else in some other subject because this cohort's not triggered yet. Does this make sense? Yes. Interesting, isn't it? So... This is the total change that Learning Council has been researching for the last year. Um, and Giovanni, I see you've joined us. And I think you played this game with us in Dallas, right? So you know. Um, okay, good. So I'm coming back to you just in a second. I let um, Superintendent uh, O'Malley take a short break. And as soon as he pops back on, we're going to the panel. So let me just finish this for you, Melvin. Um, the space rework would look something like this in hybrid logistics. And you know, the reason we really talked about this is because too many kids are triaged out. That is the biggest inequity we have. Like if you're a kid and you're running way behind in math because your parents divorced and they kind of gave you a big social emotional bashing on the head for two years, you're just kind of checked out and you're just consistently getting Fs forever, but you're not a dumb kid. No one helped you, right? You're just out individually paced subjects should have said to you, hey, we're going to double you up, triple you up on math, and we're going to pull you away from language and history for now because you're up, you're, you're doing great in this. We're going to concentrate attention and move our human resource of teaching directly to you, right? Like more time for you. So when a teacher's not managing a class all day, every day, or too many periods every day, 
and they're mostly roaming until they get that intersection, right? Ping on their mobile phone as they're walking around. Oh, you have 45 minutes to prep for a science lab. You know, get in there and get all the beakers out and everything you got to do because the kids are coming. The, the cohort was just triggered. And the teacher can watch the motion of the kids against the lessons, right? They can say, oh, those three little kids, blah, 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 we got to go back. You know, they can go into the homeroom, wherever the kid is, pull them aside and work with them individually. This is the perfection of the human intersection of teaching. Um, so that's what we're talking about there. And then the last model, Melvin, is hybrid high flex, which combines this new model, which Giovanni played with us when we were in Dallas two years ago, three years ago. Now, man, time flies. Um, for a couple hours a day or one week, one day a week, but every, everybody's in homeroom. Like we've always had homerooms for 50 years, right? But you extend that to maybe two full hours. And the first thing you Uberize is your extracurricular and your remedial. And everything else stays the same. Okay. Yeah. This is a lot to absorb. You're going to make sure you download this latest special report from the learningcouncil.com site. So um, it has all this in there, all these graphics and everything. Yeah. But that's what's going on with all the hybrid high flex, all that stuff. Yeah. Um, all right. I thank you very much. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining us. Okay. So any other questions or um, wanting to discuss this or help me with, you know, with a concern, you know, I'm happy to take that. Um, 